When I was young, my father would try his best to get me to pay attention to the sermon in church, and it was not an easy task. So he began to ask the preacher before the service began what word might appear frequently throughout worship, and then he would set that as the word of the day, and we would each keep track by tally mark on the top of our bulletin for how many times that word was said throughout the morning. At the end of the service, we would compare notes and see if our numbers matched. If we were playing that game this month, the word would definitely be compassion. It's one of those words, words that you for sure hear at church, but it's not an exclusively churchy word. It's has something to do with love, but it's not exactly a synonym of love. This week at Compassion Camp, we begin to define what compassion is. What does it look like when it's lived out? And so this is how we've been talking about it. Compassion is when I see your hurt, I feel your hurt with you, this is empathy, and if my compassion is strong, I do what I can to ease your hurt. So compassion is, I see your hurt. I would expand that to be, I sense your hurt, because I can certainly hear how you're in pain and how you are suffering as well. I feel your hurt with you. That's empathy. It's also a coming alongside and not assuming that I know exactly how you feel, but I'm moved and I hurt with you. And if my compassion is strong, I do something, whatever I can to ease your hurt. And so our story today is the text that we'll be talking about this whole next week in Compassion Camp, which means that you are already ahead of the game by watching this. It takes place right at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. We are in chapter 2, and in chapter 1, Jesus first arrived at the city of Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he met Peter and Andrew and James and John. Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a bad fever, and when Jesus heard that, he was moved to compassion. And so he went to her, and he held her hand, and he healed her. This didn't happen uh, all the time. It wasn't the sort of thing that happens every day. And so, of course, the news spread like wildfire. And all of the sudden, everyone in town with a broken arm or a sinus infection or a janky hip or a persistent rash came to see this Jesus guy. And what did Jesus do? He healed them late into the night. In the morning, he snuck away uh, on a walk by himself, but his new friends found him again and let him know that the healing line was forming, and Jesus suggested a road trip instead. But every town they went to was the same. There are hurting people everywhere, after all. And so Jesus healed them, and his reputation grew, and so did the crowds. When he got back to his new hometown of Capernaum, the news got out that he was there, and so people flocked to him. The house he was visiting was swarmed with folks trying to get a glimpse or just a moment of his time, and every square foot was clogged with people longing to be near him. The swarm of bodies filled the door frames and the windows so that those who came late didn't stand a chance of getting close. But there was this crew of friends that were determined to see Jesus. One of the five was paralyzed, and they had heard what he could do. If they could just get him to see Jesus, something miraculous might happen. The crowd made it not an easy task, but the friends were persistent and creative and a little bit rebellious. They got their friend onto the roof of the house where Jesus was, and they began to dig through the roof. You know that it wasn't quiet, and you know that it wasn't subtle. You know they were causing a scene, but they dug anyway, clay under their fingernails, discarding sticks, and peeping through at first a small hole where they could just glimpse Jesus looking back up, and then bigger, and then just big enough to lower their friend to him. They saw the suffering of their friend, they loved him, and they felt that hurt with him, and their compassion was strong, and so they did something, something to ease that hurt. 
they brought him to Jesus. The text says that Jesus saw the faith of the friends, and so he healed the man. Sure, there is a little kerfuffle about the words that he uses. Your sins are forgiven, or take up your mat and go home. But Jesus heals him. I think Jesus was actually showing compassion to the friends on the roof more than he was to the man at his feet. He saw their empathy and their effort and the hope they had that if they just got him to this place and it worked. The man stood up, immediately took the mat and went out before the crowd with their slack jawed, astonished faces. We have never seen anything like this. Everyone needs friends like that. Holy friends that really see you. In his book, Christian Social Innovation, Greg Jones writes about these kinds of friends. Holy friends address the gap between who we are and who God calls us to be. They help us to see the world first and foremost through the eyes of God so we can locate ourselves in the larger story of God. And when our own self-understanding is distorted by destructive mindsets or deep pain, holy friendships reorient us. They remind us of our truth and they stir our imaginations. Holy friends challenge the sins that we have come to love help us affirm the gifts that we are afraid to claim and enable us to dream dreams we would otherwise not have thought possible. These sorts of friends are not called holy because they're particularly devout. It's not the people that are called holy, it's the friendship. These friendships find their root in the love of God and they don't turn a blind eye to hurt or suffering, but they see it, they name it, and they hold it in tension with great hope. I have holy friends, and they are a gift from God in my life. They are unimpressed with my sin, as Nadia Boltz Weber says, and they see past the lies that I tell myself to know what God sees in me, and they repeat it back to me sometimes over and over and over again. They see me, and I am thankful. But this has not always been true in my life. Right after I graduated from college, I started working full-time as a youth director, and a childhood friend of mine that is my younger sister's age came to work for me as a summer intern. I'd just moved to a new place, and I didn't really know anyone. And Kendall and I had grown up together, and we were friends, but I was more his boss, and he was more like my kid brother than my buddy. And so we were together on a mission trip and driving back from the hardware store when he got a call from a guy that he went to school with. He told me to pretend like I wasn't in the car and he answered the call from this friend that was obviously having a hard time. For 15 minutes, I awkwardly listened to one side of their conversation and I was so struck by the deep vulnerability and the tender encouragement between these two bros. There were moments when Kendall spoke hard truths to his friend and held him accountable to things that they had clearly discussed before, and it was fantastically beautiful. And it was the type of relationship that I was completely missing in my life. And in the deepest part of my heart, I silently and longingly articulated the words, I wish I had a friend like that. I didn't think that I was praying, but it was one of the times in my life that I have been so sure that God was speaking to me. Quietly, kindly, truthfully, immediately, right back into the silence of my heart, I understood God to say, you will never have friends like that if you're not a friend like that. Something in me broke open that day and I have never ever been the same. God calls us to be holy friends, to be people of compassion that see suffering, have empathy, and work within our power to alleviate pain. And yes, we are called to be that to those who are close to us, to those who we've come to know deeply after dozens of meals together. And we are also called to be a part of a larger community of holy friends that is the church and to see and listen to the hurt of our community, to feel it, 
to speak to the systemic sin of our culture and to recognize the gifts that are there, to dream dreams and to imagine a better world, and then to join God in the work of making it so. This weekend, we lost a giant in the death of Congressman John Lewis. He was a holy friend to all who suffer from the pain of hurt and injustice. He was a proponent of finding a way to get in the way. And he did, at lunch counters and as a freedom rider on buses and on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and in Congress his entire adult life. He was not blind to suffering, but he also held it in tension, always marching for the hope of a better world, one that more reflects the kingdom of God. He was no stranger to trouble, arrested 40 times in his attempts to right the wrongs of inequality, and then five more times after he got to Congress. But he called that good trouble. His call to us is when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, say something, do something, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. Like, I don't know, digging a hole through a roof to get your friend the help that he needs. Some people might call it destruction of property, but not Jesus, not in this story. Jesus saw it and smiled. He saw the faith of these holy friends who knew that their action would matter. They saw their friend's pain, his struggle. They had heard about his trials of what it was to be a person who is paralyzed in first century Galilee or 21st century Houston for that matter. And they felt that pain for their friend and with their friend and they did something. They found a way to get in the way. Jesus saw their hope and their faith and their effort and he called it good trouble, necessary trouble. And he healed their friend. He called out the haters and then he kept on marching to the beat of liberation and invited people to follow, including you and me. Holy friends, may you know that you already have one in Jesus who sees you and loves you deeply. And may we be holy friends to those who are near us and those in our community. And it is my greatest hope that you will have holy friends that bless you with compassion, that see what God sees in you, that inspire you to dream, and that when things get rough, will carry you to the feet of Jesus. Amen.